Uh, very warm welcome to everybody here with us this Sunday morning. And if you're watching us live on YouTube, then please consider liking this video and subscribing. This autumn, we're thinking about how great it is to be part of God's church. And we're starting a little series uh, thinking about Jesus' teaching about the ultimate success of God's church. Our reading today is Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 28. God has opened Peter's eyes to see that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, the long-expected ruler and rescuer of this world. And in verse 18 of our reading, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So however weak and unimportant the church in our part of the world appears, Christ Jesus, the ruler of the world, has promised to build it. And no power, seen or unseen, physical or spiritual, political or military, will be able to stop Jesus Christ building his church. Well, later we'll be thinking more about this from God's word. But for now, let's pray as we begin. Almighty God, your son has become one of us to establish his kingdom and bring your chosen people into your church. Please help us to learn more about your unstoppable plan for your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And our first song today is about God's word. And the refrain goes, your word endures forever. And it reminds us that the Bible is God speaking to us and that his words are eternal. Let's stand and sing this song together. More than just letters on pages, it's life, 
and its love and its freedom for us. Your word is more than just wisdom of ages, its treasures are endless, it's always enough. Your word is more than just stories of old, it's the truth and the way and the story of love. Your word is more than just breath into dust, it's your son as a man come to dwell here with us. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my path. For your word is my hope, it's my joy and my song. Your word endures forever. Your word endures forever. Thank you so much. Do please take a seat. And if you would turn with me to Psalm 110 today. The word's going to come up on the screen if you haven't got access to it in, in, in any other way. We're going to say this psalm together today because it reminds us that Jesus is the promised Christ of the Scripture. And it assures us that he is all-powerful in the world. Sometimes we look at the weak church and our own weakness as Christians, and we think that God's king is not in charge, either of the church or of the world. But the Bible tells us everywhere that God's king is calling all the shots. He always has been. He is now. He always will be. He's in charge. And we're going to say this psalm uh, just to remind us about that. It's a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on the day of battle Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way and so he will lift up his head high. Well, if we've uh, lost sight of who the Lord Jesus Christ is, here's a prayer of confession to say that we're sorry if we've forgotten this and lived as if uh, this world is not in his hand and under his control. Almighty God, almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you with my whole heart my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts I have done to others, and the good I have left undone. O God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you, and raise me to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So now hear these words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. With these words of comfort to encourage us, we can pray together this next prayer. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, a number of notices to pass on today. And the first is to say a very big thank you to John and Lizzie, to Derek and Val Lee, and to the many others who have been helping for the, to arrange and came to enjoy the party yesterday. It was a fun afternoon for all who came to enjoy lots of castle bouncing, duck hooking, coin rolling, and rat splatting. Not to mention the copious amounts of homemade cake and popular mocktails and barbecue food that was consumed. Uh, for those who weren't able to make it, do keep an eye on our website and our social media accounts, and we'll be posting some of the many photographs taken uh, by Ruth and by Tanya, and our thanks to them, our photographers. We're very pleased to say, second, that the EMU music team are coming to join us this Saturday, the 11th of September, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. to do a masterclass introducing the key elements of how to lead and engage, uh, how to lead engaging singing for the church family and how best to use whatever resources we have. It's for musicians, for sound people, and service leaders. If you'd like to attend, please sign up on the link or the video description at the end of this, or speak to John Lee or to, De or to Denise. At this autumn, the PCC is inviting the church family to a better story. It's a short series of talks, testimonies, and Bible studies that will help us to understand and contribute to the discussion on human sexuality and marriage that the church family, that the Church of England has been inviting us to participate in. This series is starting on the 21st of September in the parish hall. Uh, it may not be your first choice of subject, it's not mine, but looking at it positively, it gives us the opportunity to look at some foundation principles of how to think and live as God's people in the 21st century. Very important series, God's Better Story, beginning on the 21st of September. After closing for the pandemic, the Horizon Club is starting up again this Wednesday, the 8th of September, from 1.45 to 2 p.m. It will include all the usual music and fun as Alvira leads the exercise class. We're very grateful to Vilma Robinson and her team who have got this popular club back up and running, particularly as Vilma has got a heavy heart at this time uh, in bereavement, as has our dear sister Isilda, and our thoughts are very much with you. It's a sad day. In some ways, um, Rosie and Jimmy are moving to another church. Rosie and Jimmy, could you come up and join us, just uh, say a few words about uh, what you're doing and <clears throat> to share with us your, your moves and, and thoughts and plans? It's lovely to see Judah here today. What a glorious baby. How good God is. I was just... I was just laughing because Jimmy said, you do the talking and I'll hold the baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a good deal. Um, Rosie, you've been part of the church family all your life. Yeah. And you've, you're moving to another church. And uh, it's for a good reason. Um, we're, we're delighted to, to, about that. So could you just tell us a little bit about what you're doing and planning? Yeah, so, um, yeah, well... Uh, as you joined the church, Ian, I was born, so yes, the same course. year, so we've been, we worked out, so, um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, so, with the baby and Jimmy working Sundays, sometimes, it would just have been too difficult for me to get, to get, really, to get the bus down all the way from Purley, so we decided um, for that, and also for us to be able to get to know some, kind of, local Christian um, families, um, to move to a more local church, and we've, we've been going along to a, a really small church, um, and uh, been very welcoming to us, and they did. They, you know, they made food for us when Judah was born, and been very welcoming. So, but it's been, been lovely to meet new mums who also have young babies and um, who who love Jesus, and that's been really exciting for us. Sounds that sounds like a very good good reason for having to move. And what would you like to be us to be praying for you as you make this move? Yeah, thank you. So, um, just that God would lead us to know uh, one. There's lots of church options in Purley, which is fantastic. Um, lots of gospel-based churches, brilliant. Just that we'd know the, the right one for us. Um, 
yeah, and that we'd be able to get settled into the community there. And I guess long term, um, you know, we're always ongoing praying for Judah and um, for Gemma's girls that they would grow up knowing, uh, knowing Jesus, and that he, they would give their life to Him um, at a young age. That's what we pray, um, you know, all the time. So we'd we'd love that to be prayed for as well. Let's uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for giving uh, Rosie to your church here over these years. And we pray that you'll please lead her and Jimmy and Judah to the the church uh, where they'll be most useful and most fruitful in growing in Christ-likeness. Thank you for their desire to uh, to witness to the Lord Jesus amongst uh, young mothers. I pray that you'll lead them to those in whom you're working. And we ask that prayer for Judah and for Gemma's twins, that that you'll please be at work in each of these children's hearts uh, right from these earliest years and incline them to to the Lord Jesus. Please open their eyes that they may see him, uh, their ears that they may hear his word and come to know him through it, and their hearts uh, that they may love him and come to trust him. And we ask that you'll please go before them and lead them to the right church for them. And we ask that you'll please bless Holy Redeemer Church and enable us to, uh, to, to go on serving you here and as we continue in fellowship over the coming years and see each other uh, less frequently, but uh, it's still in, in, in the, the joy of Christian f- fellowship in your eternal church. We pray that you'll enable us to go on encouraging one another and praying for one another. And we ask these things through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Lucy and Jerry, thanks so much. This little chat is great. It's wonderful. Well, finally to say that there will be a short break after the service. Uh, during the break, uh, the children and younger adults will be joining us from the meeting in the hall next door. And then we'll be meeting as a family with all the, the ages, uh, an intergenerational gathering around the Lord's table uh, to share bread and wine together. Our prayers are now going to be led for us by, by Clara. Let's pray. Almighty God, Jesus Christ has promised that you hear us when we ask in faith. Please receive these prayers we offer. We thank you that we are able to gather together here today. We pray that you would build us up and strengthen us through your word. Thank you for the love of Christ that binds us together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, we pray for our world. Lord, we don't understand why such terrible things happen, but we know from your word that you are a faithful God who keeps his promises and that we can put all our trust in you. Father, may we not be anxious, but may you turn our hearts to your ways, show us what to pray for and show us how we can help those who are suffering. We thank you that you are a God of justice and a God of mercy, and that one day there will be a new world without injustice, where peace will reign. For now we ask that you will hear the cries of all those who are suffering or in distress, whether due to war or natural disaster. Lord, we pray for the people of Afghanistan. Lord, have mercy and bring them peace. May those who have left the only home they have ever known find shelter and rest and be welcomed with open arms. Please protect the vulnerable who have been left behind. And we also think of those in places suffering storms and floods. Please would you bring rescue and restoration. Equip those who are serving as peacemakers, aid workers and emergency services workers and give them strength, stamina and courage. And Lord, may you strengthen ordinary Christians caught up in these disasters. May they shine as stars in the midst of chaos and disaster. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Father, help us to look after our world responsibly. Thank you for the natural resources you have given us, and please may we use them wisely and respectfully. 
Help us to make good choices that do not exploit this world or other people. And thank you, Lord, for the grace that you have shown us. We don't need to be perfect to be accepted by you, and we don't expect perfection from each other. Help us to do what we can in love and in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray for our mission partners, for David and Catherine Kariuki in Kenya, Rick and Alana Crichton in Nigeria, Roland and Famida Tamini in Burkina Faso, and Stephen and Helen Musukomaye in the Gambia. Lord, we thank you that you have raised these workers up and thank you for the gifts and talents that they are using for your glory. Keep them safe, Lord, and keep them faithful. We pray that you would bless their work and make it fruitful. And Lord, we pray for our church family, and um, for members of our church family who are making new starts in new locations. For Arnold, for the Mupanduki family, and for Rosie and Jimmy, we pray that you would make their paths smooth and ask that you will guide them, protect them, and provide them with encouragement and help them to continue to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the summer party yesterday and for John and Lizzie and their family who made it all happen. Thank you for the church, that the church family was able to welcome the local community in this way. We pray that Holy Redeemer would be a place of welcome for all. We thank you for our local community and the amazing people you have placed us among. Father, thank you that you welcome all people to put their trust in you and that one day we will worship you alongside people from every nation, tribe and tongue. We pray for our church, that we would be welcoming to all and understanding to all. We pray for our minister Ian, all the Holy Redeemer staff, for the PCC and all those who serve at our church. Strengthen them for their work and witness and help them to faithfully continue to share the good news about the Lord Jesus and his rescue plan. And Father, we thank you that you are always with us. We pray for all those facing changes and embracing new challenges and ask that you will strengthen them in their faith. And Father, we pray for those in our church family who are having a difficult time, whether through illness or grief or in other ways. And we, thank that, and we ask that you, they would know your comfort and strength. We lift up to you Cecil and Coral Devonish, Joyce Welcome, Val and Beryl Bartlett, Arthur Petch, Libby Feezy, Damien Evans and family, and Clarice Ranlow. And we pray for Isilda and Vilma and their families as they grieve the loss of much-loved family members. We pause for a moment to pray for them and for others known to us. Lord, please bring comfort and healing to all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. Lord, please accept all these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we'll be doing the Lord's Prayer as part of the service later with the Lord's Supper, just in case you think I've forgotten. Today's reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, reading from verse 13 to 28. Matthew 13, Matthew 16, 13 to 28. Sorry. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer things at the hands of the elders, the chief priest, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be, to, to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we come to this part of God's word. Heavenly Father, may your word be our rule, may your spirit be our teacher, and may your glory be our supreme concern as we come to your word today. We pray for this through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, experts uh, analyze a crisis like the pandemic in three phases. The first is the response phase, uh, then there's the recovery phase, and then there's the reconstruction phase. And we're in the, the reconstruction phase. This autumn, we're following a series about God's church because, let's face it, the church, like many other individuals and institutions, has been quite dented by this pandemic. We're starting our series with three Sundays from Matthew, chapters 16 and 18, and then we're moving on to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which is all about the church. Today we're in Matthew chapter 16, 13 to 28, which you've just had read. Our key verses are verses 18 and 19. I tell you, Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. These words are spoken by Jesus soon after Peter's confession that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And immediately, Jesus went on to speak about the subject very close to his heart, the church and what he is about to do to build it. 
And from verses 18 and 19, our points today are <clears throat> the church is built by Christ, the church is built on Christ, and the church is built like Christ. So first, the church is built by Christ. Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Christ Jesus is the builder of the church. The church is weak in our part of the world and at our time in history, but it will be built and it will be glorious because it's not us who are building it, who are weak. It's Christ who is building it, who is strong. Christ Jesus pictures the church as the building which he is building. The church is a building built around Jesus Christ as the cornerstone is the picture that the Bible gives us through Peter in his letter. And here also we see <clears throat> that the church is also described as an assembly, a gathering of people. In verse 18, the word for church is ecclesia, gathering. The church is the community of people gathered by Jesus around Jesus. Jesus says, you know, you'll remember back in chapter, 18, chapter 11 of Matthew's Gospel, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's a very personal invitation. Come to me, not come to the church or the church building or to a religion or to a set of ceremonies or spiritual disciplines not come to communion or confession or baptism even. Come to me is Jesus' invitation. And it is the personal relationship with him that makes any of us part of his church. It's our relationship with him that we have in common. He unites us from our many different backgrounds and groups and cultures as a conductor unites the instruments of the orchestra. And also we see in these verses that the church is described as a kingdom in verse 19. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the church also has the character of a kingdom, united under the authority of its king. To be part of Christ's church is to recognize Jesus as our king. We recognize his authority by submitting to his word in the Bible. So when it comes to understanding marriage, for example, it's not what our neighbors think or what the social media platforms say or what the government is legislating or what the newspapers are offering, but it is what God says that is our rule. All these pictures are ways of making the point that relationship with Jesus is the key to being part of his church. He is the builder and the cornerstone of the building. It's coming to him that makes us part of the assembly that is united around him. He is the king of the kingdom that recognizes him as king and lives under his authority. Now, there are three uh, important implications of what we've seen here. The first is, to love Jesus is to love the church. To love Jesus is to love the church. Jesus and his church are so intimately bound together, we can't claim to love Jesus if we don't love the church that he is building. The second implica implication is, because Jesus is the builder, the church will be built. Nothing will stop Jesus building the church. Verse 18 of our reading, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you, you're Peter, on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. So however weak and unimportant the church in our part of the world appears, Jesus Christ, the ruler of the world, has promised to build it 
and no power, seen or unseen, physical or spiritual, political or military, will be able to stop him building his church. The reference to the gates of hell is from Isaiah chapter 38, verse 10, where the gates of hell are clearly from the context, the gates of death. The point is, death itself will not stop Christ building his church. We are the community that one day will follow Christ through death into glory. This makes the church the only thing that will outlast this age. Our human family will not last. Our spiritual family will. The church is the community that will not be shut in by the gates of death. The Church of Christ will gloriously and beautifully fill the future. So the obvious questions are, have I come to Christ? His invitation is come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Have you? Have you submitted? Are you submitting to him as king? Only those who are, are part of his kingdom. And only those who have will be part of the glorious future that he promises to all who have come to him and are submitting to him. The third implication is because Jesus is the builder of the church, the church belongs to him. So Holy Redeemer Stratham doesn't belong to the Church of England denomination. It doesn't belong to me, the minister. It doesn't belong to Rod Thomas, our bishop. It belongs to Christ Jesus, the one who builds it, the one who rules it, the one who gathers it, us, around himself. It's not my church. It's Jesus' church. So I, we, are not to think of the church as a place to progress our career or a way of gaining respect or popularity or power or anything else for myself. The church belongs to Christ and we're here to serve him, not ourselves. So we see that the church is built by Christ and then we see that the church is built on Christ in verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Roman Catholics and Protestants over the ages have argued long over this verse. It involves a pun on Peter's new name, Petros, the rock. Roman Catholics argue that Jesus makes Peter the first in a succession of popes who are the foundation of the church. But our verse says nothing about Peter's successors or infallibility or the exclusive authority of the Roman Catholic denomination, which claims that for its popes. They claim exclusive authority, don't they, for the popes. So if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? Well, simply that it's built on the foundation of Peter and others, men and women like him, who see and recognize Jesus as the divine Messiah, who are committed to living as he lives and to proclaiming the good news about him that builds his church. The true church of Christ is a confessional community. We're held together by our common beliefs about Jesus, by trusting and imitating him as Peter does. One of the differences between the Roman Catholic and the Protestant denominations is our view of ministry. Catholics believe that the focus of ministry is taking the bread and the wine in what's known as the mass in that uh, part of the Christian world because they believe that we receive Jesus in this way. 
But while the sacraments are one of Christ Jesus' gifts to his church and a wonderful way of remembering and participating in his death for us, Peter wasn't a priest in that sense. He was a priest in the sense that he was a preacher of the message that Christ is the Messiah who has died and risen to build his church. So the challenge to us as a church is to preach Christ. Our mission statement as a church is to proclaim the gospel to all and make disciples of Christ. It's our privilege to preach Christ and to call on people to believe in him. Preaching is how Jesus builds his church and how he intends to continue to build it through us. Peter is not the foundation of the church, neither are any of us. Christ Jesus is, and our job is to make him known and to urge people to come to him and to follow him. He is the one who builds the church. He is the one on whom the church is built. And finally, he is the one who is making the church like him. He gives us his authority in verse 19, and he gives us his pattern of life to follow in verses 21 and 24. In verse 19, Christ gives his authority to his church. The keys of the kingdom are here. Sorry, the keys of the kingdom here are the keys of preaching the gospel. You'll remember Jesus' parting words to Peter and the rest of the disciples at the end of Matthew. Jesus' last words before returning to his Father. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the close of the age. It's the message of Christ crucified and risen that both binds and looses people. It's an awesome authority that Christ gives us, his church. Because he loves us, he has chosen us to be his messengers and enabled us to be his ambassadors, his spokesmen, his spokeswomen. With this authority comes the corresponding responsibility to pray for our loved ones and our friends. As we tell them the good news about Jesus, we must pray for them. Because this message is the most wonderful and the most dangerous, the most wonderful and the most dangerous message in the world. Wonderful, because it opens the door to eternal life to those who come to Christ and dangerous because it closes that door to those who do, don't come to him. It's the preaching of the message about him that opens the door to some and closes the door to others. I don't know if you watched much of the Olympics from Tokyo. The, uh, the BMX was quite a spectacle, wasn't it? But it's, it's a dangerous sport. And I imagine that if you're a BMX uh, Olympian, you would take all precautions to avoid the extreme damage of broken bones and other injuries that trying a trick and not pulling it off might cause. You'd put mats out. Uh, you'd make sure that you had a helmet and gloves and knee pads. Similarly, the work of preaching Christ involves taking all possible precautions. And the key precaution is praying. This is a dangerous thing that we're doing. Praying is our protection. It's the protection of those that we speak to and bring this message to. As we come to Passion for Life this Easter, now is the, now is the time to start praying for the Lord of the church to soften the hearts of the people that he has put into our lives. 
so that they will not only come to hear about him, but be given eyes to see him and hearts to trust him as they hear about him. Only God can do that. We must pray for our friends and our loved ones. So he gives his church his authority and he gives his church his example to follow. He has given up his life to make us his own, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He has given up his life to make us his own, and we're to follow his example in verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. We're to die to ourselves, to deny ourselves, to take up the cross, to follow him. This means dying to the love of self and dying to self-interest in order to do everything we can to make him known by our words and by our lives reflecting his life. The way that Jesus chose, <clears throat> the way that Jesus chose is the way that led to the cross and out of it came glorious eternal life for all who come to him. He laid down his life and gained eternal life for us. And we're to choose the path of self-sacrifice, of self-denial, confident that we won't lose and that we will gain. Look at verse 25. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven... Uh, sorry, verse 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up the cross. And he goes on to say, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. We may have made that calculation and decided to live like this in the past, but each new situation is a new opportunity to show our love for the Lord Jesus by choosing, again, to live like him. As we come to the reconstruction phase of the pandemic, it's a time of opportunity. We've got into the habit, perhaps, of church on the sofa, and it's hard getting back to live church. Other things may have filled some of our Sunday mornings. Church online is more convenient, more comfortable, more flexible than live church. Yet, Christ is inseparable from his church. He loves the church, and so must we. The church matters to him, and so it must matter to us. We're the community, the kingdom that he is building, and being together shows the world that he is alive and at work, and what his future is going to be like. So this is a good time to recommit to following his example, to put aside our own convenience and comfort, to get back together again with one another, to show the world that he is at work building his church. The gates of hell won't stop him building it, and neither will COVID-19. Let's decide today to recommit our time, to reestablish our priorities for the meeting of Christ's church. Let's commit to Christ by renewing our commitment to his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your son to build your church by his death and resurrection. Help us to see how important your church is to him and equip us to play our part in making him known by the way we live 
and by opening our lips to tell people about him. We ask this in his name. Amen. If you'd like to stand, we'll sing our, um, our last song before communion. Thank you very much for leading us in that great hymn. Do please sit down as we come to the next part of our time together. I see everybody's joined us from next door. Very warm welcome. Thanks for coming, coming around. Well, at this point, um, just uh, talk amongst yourselves, say hello to uh, some of you perhaps might not uh, recognize or uh, have met before. And um, I'll just bring up the table and we'll prepare for sharing the, the bread and the wine around the Lord's table together. And if anybody does uh, need to, to get home for any purpose uh, or any other reason, uh, now might be a good time to slip out if you do need to do that. But we hope you'll be able to join us.